What if you were guaranteed 36,500 days, 100 years, 100 years to live, a century of promised breaths to spend however you wish? Would you plan your life any differently? Would you treat your spouse, your children, your neighbors with more kindness if you knew you didn't have to worry about your health or personal safety? Would you live with a little more courage and less fear about the future? Today on State of Independence, our producer Jeff Coleman will introduce us to a centenarian who lives his life a lot like the fearless person I just described. Stay with us. One of the goals of this program is to encourage you to live fearlessly. No, not to deny the reality that life is difficult, that the world is imperfect and hurt and pain are inevitable, but to those of you who profess faith, specifically faith in God, there's a trade-off that's supposed to happen. Fear is replaced by hope. Anxiety is transformed into courage. The questions about the future are replaced by the certainty of what is to come. Jeff, uh, you went back to Quarryville Presbyterian Community in southern Lancaster County. They invited you to speak to residents about their lives and why they have hope. Tell us about one of the extraordinary people you met, I think Bob Adams. Well, uh, you know, we've been doing this series and, and dipping into this treasure trove at uh, this community at Quarryville Presbyterian uh, Retirement in southern Lancaster County. And it, first, it's a beautiful place. And it's a great spirit, and, and I've been going down there, Joe, during COVID, uh, when people um, certainly have fear and anxiety, but there's a strategy there to fight the fear, and as you just described, to replace it with faith. So one of the men that I had the privilege of meeting, the Associated Press picked up, and if you Google Bob Adams, Lancaster County, or Bob Adams, Quarryville, this incredible, long, detailed story of this man who celebrated his 100th year just a few weeks ago uh, will come up, and you'll get the full color and the full detail. Well, I had the privilege of sitting down with him and asking him, among other things, about his, uh, his life in the military. He was an Air Force veteran, uh, comes through the Great Depression, uh, goes uh, to work on a WPA program digging ditches in, uh, in Coatesville, Pennsylvania, and really stays in Pennsylvania close to home, and then uh, enlists in the, in the Air Force, and of all things gets a job as a photographer in uh, B-17s. His responsibility is to make sure that these giant, he described these yeah. cameras, these huge cameras in the belly of the B-17, uh, that they go off when the bomb, uh, the, 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 the wow. bombardier uh, triggers open the, the doors and the bombs fall, the camera is supposed to take the picture so they know where they landed. And he has to go up, uh, he says, three times to make sure that the trigger trips because it wasn't working. <laughs> but he does most of his work during the war in a photography lab. From there, extraordinary events happen. I wanna show you a little bit of the conversation that I had that describes um, how his faith carried him through, but also just how he sees the world. It's a remarkable guy. Yeah. Okay, my real name was Robert A. Adams III, and I was born in Oxford in my parents' home, was raised there until I went into World War II. You just knew you were going to be drawn into it sooner or later, and it came sooner. I was in a, a uh, heavy bomb group under the command of Jimmy Doolittle. He looked like he was tough. <laughs> he, he looked like no nonsense. I was in the photography lab. Whenever a flight took, was going on a mission, we would put aerial cameras in three of the lead ships so they had personnel like myself to fly along. When the bombs were dropped, it triggered the camera on, and from there on, it was up to the bombardier. <laughs> they just wanted me to stay out of the way, because they were busy with 50 caliber machine guns firing at the Nazis. And you had pieces of flak anywhere from 
fist size up to <laughs> the size of your head all over the place. They were having their time shooting at us too, 50 caliber also. I had a, a parachute issued to me. I had to have it with me every time I went up. The uh, bomb crews had to practice target dropping with powder bombs. But I had to be down in the camera well on my knees with a handheld camera. As soon as it hit and that cloud, I took the picture. Whether they were on target or what part of the target or whether they missed the target. And that plane then would fly right up like that and come around, around and make another loop and make another run. By the time I got up out of there, after 20 bombs were dropped, I felt a little woozy. <laughs> so when the end of the war came, I had an idea. My wife, who was not, we were engaged before I went in, I thought I'd ask her if she would like to use my parachute for her wedding gown. And I got word back in about a week, said, I love it. I would love it. <laughs> so I cut all the, the canvas and the ropes and everything off of the material, packed it in a box and sent it home to her. Made a beautiful, beautiful time. I married the love of my life and she told me she felt the same. There's nothing like living the life of a Christian. Where I am now, what's not to like? There's a Christian atmosphere over this whole place. I like that. How great thou art. That's my favorite hymn of all time. Remarkable. Yeah, I, I think what you get from him, it, you, you started talking at the beginning about people who live fearless lives. I think it's certainly a progression. He talks about the fear of being in that B-17 during those practice runs and making circles and feeling woozy. He described all kinds of other incidents where he felt he was pushed out of his immediate skill set into hard, difficult situations. Um, but what he did have is this underlying trust. And the, what, I, what I was taking notes there and said, what are, what are the ingredients of, of successful people? You know, they, all the statistics talk about marriage being a cornerstone of people who live successfully. Um, it's an institution that, that you and I be, have benefited from. You know, we both married the loves of our, our oh, life, Mark, yeah. uh, like Bob did. Um, so that, that rock is taken care of, uh, a faith, a belief in something, someone bigger than yourself, a faith in Christ for him, which, which um, another key to success, some education, um, you know, the, the turn of events, GI Bill and others allowed him to better himself through education, it still uh, is one of the, the pathways to success. And then the other thing I wrote down while he was talking was just was service. That how many people uh, realize that getting out of yourself and just serving yourself, uh, getting out of that attitude and living for others, um, he, he goes up, Bob goes on to, to start a photography business. His father helps him buy this, um, uh, this uh, photography build, uh, business in Oxford. And he shoots, I don't know what the number was, but thousands of, of weddings. And, uh, and royalty too, right? And royalty, yeah. We're gonna, I'm going to show you in a few minutes a, a clip um, of all of the people that he met. But his, his life is extraordinary. But what, how, how did he strike you? And I don't know how many centenarians you've gotten to know along the way. My, my wife's grandmother just turned 100. Uh, but have you had a lot of 100-year-olds that you've... Well, well my, 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 my mother's mother uh, lived to be 103, hmm. and, and she was healthy up until the day she, she went to be with the Lord. 
And, and so I, I remember her vividly, um, wonderful woman. And, and, and I've gotten to know other people, of course, who live to live past 100. Some of the people in our church have lived to be close to 100 years mm -hmm. old. And there's so much to learn from people. I, I don't know why it is that people suppose that once somebody gets past a certain age that they can't add anything. Right. I think it's the opposite. I think the older you get, the more you have to share, the more wisdom you have, the more the rest of us can learn from you. Right. This man, uh, Bob Adams, uh, seemed like such a wonderful, humble servant. He had a, a wonderful, humble servant heart, willing yeah. to go where he was needed and just, you know, not complaining. Uh, yeah. uh, and, and, and realizing that the things that made his life rich were things that money couldn't buy. Well, well, you say humble, and that was very clear. It wasn't like he started as a teenager with his Instagram page uh, or Facebook saying, here, I'm going to tell everyone about these wonderful things that I have done in life. I mean, imagine <laughs> if he was on social media during World War II and meeting all the, uh, these famous people throughout his life. Jimmy Doolittle, the picture that he showed of Jimmy yeah, Doolittle uh, was a picture that he took, uh, among others. I mean, he, he was up close, an eyewitness to history, but he wasn't self-promoting it along the way. I think I would have a really difficult time if I were around famous people all the time to not want to, <laughs> to yeah, put them yeah, on my yeah. Facebook feed. Right, you know, right, right. Can we just, do a selfie, you know. Uh, to do a selfie, right. you know. Um, so that generation, I think, has something to teach a lot of us, uh, me and my, and my generation in particular, uh, about the value of not self-promoting. But maybe when you're 100, <laughs> to be able to look back on your life and say, okay, you had a marriage that lasted 68 years, what could we learn from it? Yeah. Um, you volunteered to serve, what could we learn from that experience? That's probably the right way to look back. But I have another clip, and this clip, at the end of the interview, I said, um, I said did you ever meet any famous people along the way? I said, did you ever meet anybody famous? And he said, well, you'll, you'll have to see it here because it's, it's pretty incredible. <laughs> I brought a list with me in case this yeah, came up. <laughs> uh, one of my favorites was Albert Einstein. I don't think he ever had a comb or a brush. If he did, he didn't know how to use it. <laughs> President Ford, Martin Luther King Jr., he was very... Energetic. It was hard, hard to know where he was going to be at any, any second. If you wanted to take a picture, you had to be on your toes. Marion Anderson, I don't know if you knew. She, yeah. Julian Bond. Duke Ellington. He drew a real crowd. Glenn Miller. He drew a real crowd in Bedford. Jimmy Doolittle. John Ware, third. Yeah. There was other people. There was kings. <laughs> well, I mean, <laughs> that's great. Um, the, the, one of the things that he said uh, is that during one of the visits, General Doolittle arranged for then uh, the, the Queen Mother um, and Princess Elizabeth to visit the Air Force Base where he was stationed at. So he had, there, there are actually pictures that he's taken uh, with the present Queen of England, Queen Elizabeth II, as Princess Elizabeth. But, but he tells these stories not in any way to brag or take credit. Uh, he had a, a photo session with Albert Einstein. He just wasn't in the back. He was in the room taking multiple shots. So when you Google Lincoln University or Lincoln University Histor uh, Historically Black College, you have a, a history uh, yeah, with. Yeah, I was on the board there at one time. Yeah. Um, all the images that come up, those are Bob Adams uh, with, with, uh, with Albert Einstein and African-American students, which was groundbreaking at that time. He's in the room. He gets a relationship. Martin Luther King, before the I Have a Dream speech, before yeah, yeah. Selma, before Montgomery, and he has the opportunity to hear this pastor, young pastor, speaking to these students. Humility. Yeah, yeah. What a, uh, what a life. Yeah. What a life. Just, just amazing. Yeah. So um, as we've gone to Quarryville and met the people like Bob Adams, I always ask them at the end, I said, uh, do you have a favorite hymn or a scripture, something that encourages you? And uh, I said, particularly something that 
in hard times, when you are, I can't leave because of COVID, um, I can't see my spouse, I miss my spouse because she or he has been gone for years, um, or a diagnosis. I mean, many of these residents are fighting. I won't find out until afterwards um, that there was a serious diagnosis and they're smiling, they're laughing, they're having a good time. And then they tell me, like Bob did, my favorite hymn is How Great Thou Art, and then he'll, he recites it. Or um, many, uh, you know, will say Amazing Grace, or they'll say, you know, the, these, these hymns that they've memorized in their youth or maybe midlife that, uh, that come up on recall. And one of the things I've learned is that especially Alzheimer's patients or those with, with in the memory assisted unit, somehow that part of the brain where scripture and hymns are stored is protected. So they not, may not remember their dog's name. They mm. may not remember what day it is. But when it comes time to be in these difficult moments of life, they have almost immediate recall on, on some of these, uh, these amazing lines and phrases and words that help them through life. That's one of the lessons I think we've learned from that generation. Oh, just wonderful. So much to learn from them, uh, Brother Jeff. So much to learn from them. So when we come back, there is an individual I want you to meet uh, who is not quite 100. He is uh, rounding the corner, and he'll be there soon enough. But uh, he kind of went through life, did all of these amazing things, and then had a restart uh, for his life well into past 70, wow. at 80, yeah. and, uh, and then was able to say, look, uh, this idea that you never retire from your calling. I think many people, you see them once they have hit that magic number. Right. 55, they worked really hard, 65, maybe 60. And then their relatives say, you know, it's like somebody took the battery out. Yeah, yeah. You know, all of the life seems to be gone. Well, why? Yeah. Because they don't have a mission. Yeah. One of the exciting things about all the people that I've met at Quarryville is that one of the challenges that Robert Hayward, who we had on the program a few weeks ago, has, is don't think of this as a place to sit down and rest and, and, and rock and look out at the sunset. But think of this as a, just a different level, a different way of service, and, and, and persevere and find where God has you all the way to the end. Yeah. And I'm sure some of the people in your church that you've met who are persevering, yeah. that was their spirit. Yeah, well, God has something for us to do in every season of our life, doesn't he? Yeah, indeed. Yeah, yeah. what a blessing. We'll be back to meet another remarkable man who isn't 100 yet but he's lived a life that some might think could be reckless, while others would find him courageous. We'll be right back to meet him. Learn more about Joe Watkins and the mission of this program at joewatkins.net. And tell Joe what you thought about today's program in the comment box. And now let's talk with our great producer, Jeff Coleman. Well, one of the questions I always have uh, for people who are widowed, um, who no longer have their life partner is kind of how, what, what happens to your perspective? It's an idea that I can't imagine, you know, um, but I have met a number of widows and widowers at Quarryville, um, as you have in other environments, and you want to know what is their strength without their partner. Here's what I learned. I learned that most of them will either go in one direction, bitter, sad, isolated, or in the case of Bruce Helen, who you're going to meet, um, goes into a different direction, which is to, to re, be reinvigorated in his idea of service. So I sat down with him. I didn't really know what to expect um, because he was he just really full of joy and energy. And he is, by my calculations, I think he's now 88. So Bruce, if you're watching and I got that wrong, I apologize. But he is, he is rounding up to 90 pretty soon. Uh, but take a look at this. I was born in Freeport, Illinois, but shortly after moved to Judah, J-U-D-A, Wisconsin, which had 300 people. Uh, when I moved out, they changed the sign to 299. 
I was uh, married uh, while I was uh, working with my older brother and my dad. I was 24 and my uh, beautiful wife was uh, 22. Her name was Max Maxine Cher and uh, in a short time she passed away. Uh, we had maybe six months of nice time together and then she became sick with uh, lupus erythematosus. In January of 1952, went to the Great Lakes Naval Training Station, and there I began my boot camp. And they put me on a train five days to Vallejo, California. I was walking in one of the streets there in Vallejo, California, and I saw this sign. Christian Service Center, free coffee and donuts, welcome. The proprietor of the Christian Service Center came over and said, are you a Christian? Do you believe in Jesus? And I said, teach me. And so he said, uh, but as many as receive him, to them gave he the power to become a children of God, to them that believe and receive the Lord Jesus, not by works of righteousness, but by grace. Are you a Christian? Do you believe in Jesus? And I said, yes, I believe in Jesus. And that day, I became a Christian. I was in Chow Line on the ship, I looked ahead of me, and there was a fellow, he had Bible verses in his hand. So Louis Files and I began to study the, the Bible, memorizing scripture. At one time, we had a 35 men on board ship studying the Bible with us. So the Lord worked it out that there was a Christian serviceman center in Yokosuka. And lo and behold, they had two young missionary girls uh, living in Yokosuka. One of the missionaries' name was Barbara and my wife and she lived together for a couple years there in Yokosuka. After I got married, I had heart trouble. For 51 years, I had heart trouble. Every time I looked at my wife, my heart skipped a beat. Along the way, it made very, very clear to me that God wanted me to be a missionary to Japan. It just seemed to me that God was just there opening up the door and I was walking through it. My advice was, choose God, and he's going to direct you where to go. Kame wa jitsu ni sono hitori ngo o o atai ni natta hodo ni yo o ayasarata. Sore wa meko o shinjiru mono wa horobinai de e en no inochi o motsutame de aru. John 3.16, Johanna Sancho, Jew Roksetsu. Mm. What a blessing. I just want to kind of leave it there. Oh, you know? man. Um, Bruce, um, if you noticed in that narrative, he loses his first wife. He says he had six months together. I know. And then through this remarkable series of events, you know, <laughs> goes yeah, into right. the serviceman center in Japan, meets his second wife. When he loses his second wife uh, at 80, he makes this, this he says, look, I feel a calling to go back, back uh, as a, a missionary for another second pass at service. And, uh, you know, you sit there and you wonder, you know, you, we walk past uh, and sit next to in restaurants and encounter people who are chronologically older. But if you heard him speak, for Bruce, it was yesterday. Hmm. All these experiences were yesterday when he's in the, as he described it, the chow line on the ship. Hmm. And here's a guy over there memorizing scripture and that's, this forms this, this friendship for a lifetime. I think one of the things, Joe, that we're trying to do with this program is help people think about the distractions that keep us from meaningful life. Um, how do you go through life meaningfully, purposefully, 
and not be distracted by every text message and incoming because it's, all, you, you, it's almost a culture now that we can't finish books, we can't finish a sentence, we don't write letters, all of the things that make life uh, rich and meaningful. Well, the culture kind of teaches us, I think, uh, to, to be self-consumed, to be consumed with ourselves. So, you know, I mean, selfie it really yeah. epitomizes it. You right. know, it's you taking a picture of yourself, right. maybe with somebody else, but it's all about you. And what I, I get from some of these wonderful Christian people who've been blessed to live as many years on the planet as they have is that they're not consumed with themselves. Yeah, you know, they're, that's right. they're consumed with how do I serve God? How can I how can I seek first the kingdom of God and His righteousness and and and, and walk the way God want, wants me to walk? And and there's a beauty to that, a, a, a deep sense of humility, um, uh, a willingness to 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 be God's person wherever God puts them. You know, I mean, when you talked about Bob uh, earlier, he was in the in the belly of that plane, and what you don't hear him talk about is fear. You don't hear him say, "I was scared out of my mind. I could have I could have been killed." Right. That that in, in today's world, that's how we think. Right. You know, if, if somebody asks you about a situation like that, the first thing he says, "I, I could have been killed. I I I right. could have been killed. I was right. I was afraid for my life." Right. You don't hear that coming from that's Bob. That's right. You're right. You, you, these the and 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 the same. Not that is, they weren't afraid. No, but but they aren't consumed yeah. by it. They aren't consumed that's with it. themselves. Yeah. They're consumed with. Well, this, uh, this the whole idea of these foxhole prayers or. Uh, I had a friend, um, a family friend, who served on a, um, a troop carrier on D-Day, and he talked about the fear and the all of the things that are said in the last words, and hmm. um, you know, as men are going into these these horrific, you know, fireball of right. uh, of, of what could be overwhelming fear and a real situation that your life is in danger. But he also talks about all these men. Talk about, so here's what I did. Here's what I prayed. Here's what I said. And the people who had that confidence to turn to God in that moment, uh, they came back with uh, deep gratitude and appreciation. That's what you saw in Bruce um, hmm. in, in his remarkable life. Basically saying, wherever you want me to put, I love the phrase you said, um, to be God's man or God's woman wherever. Yeah, that's right. Wherever, wherever he puts you. Yeah. Yeah. You know, I just love that about that. What, just what a marvelous life. Well, well, that's all the time we have for today's program. At State of Independence, our mission is to help you trust God more fully and to love your neighbor like you want to be loved yourself. When you have a moment, please take a minute to send me a message in the comment box at joewatkins.org. I'd love to hear what you thought of today's program, and I'll respond to each one of you. A special thank you to Robert Hayward and the staff at Quarryville Presbyterian Retirement Community for allowing us to share these lessons of faith. And a special thanks to Jeff Coleman. From America's first capital, Philadelphia, I'm Joe Watkins. Thanks for watching. I love these stories. I know who I want to be like when I grow up. He's, you know, <laughs> yeah. I mean, yeah. Yeah. pretty amazing people. Amazing people. Amazing people. It's moving, moving stuff. You know, yeah. the, the 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 way they tell these stories, you know, in, in such a matter of fact way. <laughs> right. Know? Joe Watkins State of Independence is a production of Lighthouse TV, positively different, made possible in part because of the support of viewers like you.